auspicious remarks on an auspicious day. Both the, uh, the season and one of the songs sets one in a mood, doesn't it? Don't it always seem to go <laughs> that you don't know what you got until it's gone? Uh, sometimes I think that way about religion is an and ecology. When people lose their uh, inner authenticity, you know, sometimes we want to shrink religion down to the institutional religions, but I think we all know it's a much bigger game than that. Huh? And Mencius, the Confucian thinker, he would talk about inner authenticity. When you lose that religion, when you lose that inner authenticity, where do you go? You know, you lose your pigs or your chickens and your dog. You go out on the front and you call for them, and there's a good chance they'll come. But you lose that. Don't it always seem to go? That you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And you lose that. And at your age, well, maybe some have a sense of it, but that as the years and decades tick on, it's gone like a dog sometimes. It's gone like a really good friend. You, know, you, like you think uh, you can hear me now? Well, we're we need to the recording. Oh, sorry. sorry. Well, that's the best part. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> so the religion, uh, losing that uh, ecology, I guess that's where I'm at at this point in my life. I, I have seen, uh, along with Mary Evelyn Tucker, some scenes that I wanted to show you that set me on this career. So let me launch into it. Uh, I wanted to suggest by these terms of field and force that uh, what we're about, um, uh, that this collaborative activity that we're calling religion and ecology, is uh, to establish an academic field. So. Here at Yale, we teach courses uh, in religion and ecology and have a joint degree program between the Divinity School and Forestry and Environmental Studies. And also then the sense of force. This is an engaged project. I think by the end of it, you get a sense of what I mean, both from these slides and then from the short video piece afterwards. We're engaged scholars. Huh? We're, we're interested in the abstract, to use that term. And I'd like to make maybe some uh, apologia or defense of the abstract, maybe in the question and answer time. But uh, we're also interested in the engaged, on the ground, religious environmentalism. So this project has both of those types of concerns. Often uh, our colleagues in the academic world will say, you've crossed the line. You've lost objectivity. You've given over to your own subjectivity of engagement. Our colleagues who are on the ground working in projects say, Grim, you're too abstract. You're just an academic. So we're navigating along this uh, kind of a nice edge, trying to do some work. Huh? Maybe uh, an overview of these remarks is uh, I'm trying to get at some of the cultural values that are shaped by uh, worldviews. Uh, from the standpoint of, uh, I have world religions here down, but I, I wanted to suggest not simply the institutional traditions. We can talk more about that. Uh, humanitarian and secular values, the sense of environmental ethics. Uh, Willis Jenkins up at the Divinity School does very fine courses in this regard. Question of behavior with regard to the natural world. Stephen Kellert and uh, Ed Wilson at Harvard had, uh, Stephen Kellert uh, formerly at the forestry environmental studies have paid a lot of attention to biophilia. And Keller will talk about it as gen we're genetically coded, which I find very interesting in terms of Thomas Berry, who I'll show in a bit. Uh, aesthetic in the arts, huh? so the type of uh, sensing and minding, if I could use that kind of language, sensing minding that leads to creating. I think the arts gives us some very good indications of this kind of philosophical, uh, and uh, aesthetic understanding. Uh, just a few slides, and let me move through them quickly. Huh? It's more of a mood that I want to create here. These are uh, put in by Mary Evelyn Tucker, who, in terms of globalization, uh, if, uh, Professor Wolf is in China. Mary Evelyn is currently in uh, India. She's uh, helping uh, push along a project that we have, which I'll talk about later, and also at an Earth Charter meeting. Uh, 
please then take a note. Uh, take a look at earthcharter.org, uh, I believe. If I have it wrong, if it's .com, try both. But the Earth Charter is a very interesting uh, effort at a global ethics with regard to uh, these issues. So it's, it's worth a uh, look at. And they're celebrating 25 years since this document was done at Ahmedabad in India. So uh, her whole impulse on this rel religion and ecology project uh, comes from her studies in East Asia, especially Japan. And in that setting, her encounter not only with the uh, constructed natural world of the East Asian uh, Confucian and Buddhist traditions, but also the political uh, implications of Confucianism, which is her field. Now, it may seem strange that I'm, I'm moving over a number of uh, so-called religions or fields of very quickly Confucianism, Buddhism, uh, and uh, associating them with one person. But in fact, in the East Asian sphere, uh, it was uh, Buddhism that carried Confucianism to Japan. So these traditions interact much more significantly. And the ways in which they have interacted with the natural world uh, influenced her. So she came to this project uh, with that uh, 1970s encounter in East Asia. And it was uh, gradually over the years then, as we lived in these settings, and uh, we returned for her work uh, to live for some three years uh, in uh, Japan. And we could see this uh, change in the landscape in East Asia, which is uh, so uh, evident today to people who come and visit in those areas. The sense of um, the air quality, uh, it's remarkable to see the changes that have happened in the last 30 years in, say, Bangkok. Huh? You think of where uh, Seoul, Korea was. When I first went to study with ecstatic practitioners, healers called mudong, women who are uh, shamanic practitioners, and where Seoul was when I first visited and where it is now recently. I mention healers because my primary field and what brought me into these studies in religion and ecology is my work with the nor North, uh, um, North American, American Indian peoples. Huh? Uh, these uh, Crow Apsaloke people, and this is a family that I've worked with uh, mo most closely, John Cummins uh, with the glasses in the back is uh, the older gentleman. Ah, I have one of these. Uh, is uh, a, what the Crow call an Ak Balia. Balia is a person, and AK, a suffix put to indicate instrumental activity on the part of that uh, which follows, so it's a person who can do something. And as a healer and working with him for 30 years, it's very interesting to, to begin to enter into those cultural understandings that crow people have to their natural world. And of course, one of the ceremonials that uh, I first went to study in 1979 and that brought me into these understandings is uh, what outsiders call a sun dance, but what the crow call ashkise liswa. Liswa is to dance. And Ashkise is a difficult word to translate, big lodge, but its intention is an imitation lodge. This is a lodge built to make present the cosmos. So uh, Neil's remarks earlier about cosmological thinking in the religions, it's on the ground with these people. Uh, this lodge is only halfway through now, but you also notice the stuffed buffalo head and there's a stuffed eagle in the rafters. So there's an effort to bring the presence of also biodiversity into this cosmos. It's not just human, men and women who will come in here and dance. And they dance for three, four, or five days, depending on the person who sponsors it. And they go without food or water. And their effort is then to achieve something they call diagashe. Sincerity, may authenticity, that inner something that makes a person but it's a person in relationship to this, uh, this place where the poles, the lodge poles come from, where the buffalo come from. They have a herd of 600 buffalo in a box canyon in the Bighorn Mountains. Where the eagles come from, because the dancers blow on eagle bone whistles when they uh, perform this ceremonial. And this uh, whistling, this constant whistling of the men and women dancing will draw eagles out of the mountains. And they'll, they'll gyre over this lodge. So you're, this uh, effort to achieve diagashe, this sincerity, is in relationship to these elements. Huh? So here's a, uh, a religion then that uh, has 
has definite agendas with regard to interior experience. But it's also the case that indigenous people now uh, are making their mark uh, in the res world of resistance huh? through their religions or life way. I prefer that term rather than religion. Though I don't want to erase religion, but I prefer life way because their religious activities are not pulled apart from the world as they know it, the world of everyday activity. So Native people would see this resistance as having something to do with their life way, with their sincerity, with their authenticity, with their relationship with the world. So this uh, tar sand uh, demonstration by Northern Canadian peoples is in league with, say, the UNDRIP document, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, at which there were uh, only, of the nations of the, of the United Nations, only four who refused to sign it, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the United States. And New Zealand and Australia have reversed and have signed. Uh, Canada has not, nor is it's not considering changing it. Uh, the United States, under this administration, is uh, reflecting and calling back its decision to rethink it. Huh? So it's very interesting to, to feel the, um, the effect of indigenous people in so many of these issues. So these t this type of background is what really brought me into this religion and ecology project along with a scholar named Thomas Berry who taught Mary Evelyn and myself. I did my dissertation with Berry at Fordham University. And Mary Evelyn did a master's and then went to Columbia's East Asian and Languages program to do Confucianism. But uh, this guy's vision uh, really uh, ar articulated itself uh, after he was 60. And he lived to be 94. And I think it was this vision that carried him on. He really. Uh, all of these uh, books that are mentioned here were published uh, after he was 60. He has a whole set of works uh, prior to this on uh, his work as a historian of religion, or a cultural historian is a better term. Uh, his uh, understanding of these issues comes from out of his uh, concern uh, with regard to cosmology. He was interested in the cosmology of religions, that those religions he uh, put his mind to study and acquire some understanding of. It was their cosmology that interested them, their story of, the, of reality as we know it. And so his focus then became on the universe itself. And his question became, where are we as a species, we humans on this planet? What's our story as a whole? So the globalization project was, is very much in the background of his work. Because his concern was, we have many stories from the traditional communities. And they are still valorized. They still motivate, as Neil's point made. But we are also very much aware that they don't made motivate as they did in the past. And so his uh, concern was, we now have a scientific story of our emergence uh, from uh, early um, primal flaring forth of uh, reality as we know it, into the galaxies and the solar system and life on Earth here, and the human community itself. So that became for him a new story. And uh, it was that story that he felt raised the question, a new question for us, that the universe as we know it uh, is, has this subjectivity. So uh, there's uh, Lot, many questions that uh, draw forth some closer philosophical attention than Barry himself could give uh, before he died. But he left a legacy which is very interesting. For example, he has this uh, observation that uh, this moment that we face is utterly unique. And so that in itself marks the uh, difference of this moment for the so-called world religions. It marks it also for the non-believing community, the uh, new atheists, the um, community of uh, uh, secular uh, political activity. All of us experience this moment in our own unique way. And for Barry, one of these abiding questions would be, um, we have not even thought about this in the world religion. Uh, we have a very clear ethical regards for these issues. If you cut yourself, or if you cut other people, if you kill other people, even now genocide in the 20th century. 
But these uh, concepts of ecocide or biocide or geocide still perplex the religious traditions. Huh? This project then uh, is, uh, grows out of an awareness, this religion and ecology pro uh, project, out of the types of issues that we're uh, all, all aware of in this class, huh? the, the sense of uh, uh, urbanization and uh, alienation from the land in, in conjunction with the uh, prior issues, huh? that <coughs> climate change and all of the global issues that go with that and biodiversity loss, these probably the uh, two more prominent uh, global environmental issues that we're aware of. And as we see these species uh, wink out, uh, it's, an, it's an issue um, uh, about this, uh, you, don't, um, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And uh, it's enough to give a person agita uh, at some days. And so Neil's remark about environmental despair is easy. Uh, but finding hope, uh, these are people also that we find hope with in terms of dialogue partners. Our coming to forestry and environmental studies was very important for us. Our whole career has been in religious studies. So the divinity school is very familiar. Religious studies, it's a very familiar setting for us. But forestry and environmental studies, these are the people then that raise questions for us which are very sharp provide information for us which is ever-changing, but at least probing in a contemporary mode. Huh? And uh, Gus Beth has been quoted several times. And again, just to reemphasize Neil's point, Gus Beth has said very clearly, 40 years of a career establishing pro uh, the foremost environmental organizations in the United States for monitoring environmental health a career in the United Nations Development Program. And for him to say, after 40 years, knowing that we have the science, that we have the legal uh, laws quite often in the books, not only in this country, but let's say in China also, in India also, the laws are on the books. But we do not have the motivation, he would say. We have not turned the corner on this. And why not? That's his question. Why not? Where's the motivation? So he's now calling for greater participation from the religions, from the uh, philosophical community, from the arts. And so our project in religion and ecology has sought to really interact <clears throat> on the policy side at the top and then on the religion side on the bottom, huh? so that our effort is to share a, a common sense that uh, we feel we have in common, common with the uh, science community. Huh? Cellular life has opened itself up in ways that maybe for those of us who are not scientists, we, we begin to understand even the amazing character of photosynthesis and to think about uh, what it means to come to the symmetry of growth in its larger expression, even ourselves and our movement through time and the varieties of beings that we share this planet with and the wonder the incredible wonder that uh, all of this presents to us. And so these kinds of projects, as I've indicated before, with Thomas Berry and his uh, uh, focus on cosmology, have brought us to one of the projects that I invite you all to participate in March 25th uh, at the Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, we will show a new film which we have made uh, called Journey of the Universe. It's an effort by a mathematical cosmologist, Brian Swim, to literally tell the story of the emergent universe. And I think that character of story is something we might talk about in the question and answer. So uh, March 25th, the religion and ecology project on the religion side is uh, significantly oriented towards uh, uh, assisting religions to move into their ecological phase so that uh, these uh, religious leaders, the Dalai Lama, Benedict XVI, um, Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, someone help me, what's his first name? Cronin. Cronin, thank you, Cronin. And uh, the Green Patriarch, not so many people know Bartholomew, the patri uh, ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople or Istanbul, a major uh, spokesperson for uh, religious environmentalism. I'll speak more of him in just a moment. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, many of you should know, 
the Dharma Master Chung Yun, over 6,000 recycling centers in Taiwan. She is a Zen uh, Buddhist uh, uh, leader in uh, Taiwan who's become very active in global outreach, so eco-justice, human justice tied to environment. And uh, these other leaders, obviously the, the sense of uh, environmental justice picturing Wangari and Matai is also a major concern of this religion and ecology project because this um, issues of environmental uh, pollution, of environmental problems due to climate change affect people on the ground. And so the uh, religious traditions, not only in their uh, uh, beliefs and practice, but also in their on the ground activity. So the Tsuji problem, um, or the Tsuji uh, sect was the picture there. But I wanted to move into the area that um, Neil also mentioned that religions definitely have to be considered uh, in their problematic character in this uh, uh, context of religion and ecology also. We've had a, a recent uh, occasion uh, in the election, I think, to see some of these statements on the, on the margins also uh, with regard to climate change. Uh, I received an email today uh, outlining the statements by some of the new members of the House with regard to climate change and labeling it a hoax, uh, labeling it simply a cyclical pattern. It's due to sunspots. So we have a um, very interesting connection here between the political and the religious where there's, there's a, a mutual um, interaction there where the intolerance and unwillingness to uh, consider these questions mark some of the religions. Also within the religions uh, you find transcendent orientations which uh, would tend to remove people from concern for the material world. So it's obviously one of the problems in the religious traditions that's uh, evident and uh, historical uh, issues where nature is devalued which have resonated into the present. For example, the um, charge of paganism which is uh, used quite often in discussions to simply uh, appropriate the ground that any Christian or any of the Abrahamic traditions especially, anyone from the Abrahamic traditions who would give attention to the natural world as an integral reality uh, sometimes might be charged with paganism. It's a kind of nature devalued card, I think. The anthropocentric focus, I think, is a major concern, say, in the seminaries where uh, Christian uh, yeshivas uh, or the um, uh, Islamic teaching centers, the uh, name escapes me right now, where the um, anthropocentric focus is very clear. The traditions uh, educating clergy to meet uh, challenges often in a hu human earth context only. Uh, the promise of religion is also uh, very evident once one begins to consider it, namely uh, large numbers of people in institutional authority as well as the uh, possibility of retrieval from textual traditions, from ritual traditions, from the commentarial traditions, uh, a new understanding of what these traditions have actually said about uh, individuals and communities in relationship to bioregions. So this is a very, uh, uh, um, very significant part of this religion and ecology project and is actually part of where we began this project. Obviously a, one of the positive promises of religion is the capacity to educate and bring people into some suasive encounter. Environmental ethics and action, the uh, roof here of the Yale Divinity School prior to the building of the new Kroon uh, Center for uh, Forestry. This was the largest solar array on campus. And also uh, an evangelical college with a obvious uh, interest in, uh, in uh, environmental activity. And notice the language issue here, how people finding their own language to talk about these issues in the religions. A, a text uh, slide which uh, rather than simply uh, repeating the slide, I think it gives you a sense of the range of activities that we need to understand. And I think Neil was going at the same thing with regard to uh, ecological positions or perspectives in the religious traditions. So that when I talk about retrieving in the traditions, bringing forward the past, I think these are the areas in which to consider this retrieval act. But I don't think they mean much unless we reevaluate what is retrieved. Huh? So does it have anything to say to the present? If it does, if a tradition's past 
speaks to contemporary issues. Then I think it calls also for reconstruction of tradition. So retrieval, reevaluation, and reconstruction are major agendas of this religion and ecology project. And of the three, reconstruction is obviously the most difficult. Religions are very conservative, slow to change, and to, so to consider reconstructing themselves is very difficult. I want to move through these very quickly. I think in the readings you got a sense of the project that we had done. It, uh, after 10 conferences, it culminated with several conferences in New York and the formation of the Forum on Religion and Ecology, which we brought to Yale, and the publication of these volumes. Over 800 scholars have collaborated in the initial beginnings of this project and brought these uh, books, which are still very fine uh, resource works in this field. We have a, a journal now, which is a peer-reviewed journal. It's, uh, uh, it's 12 years old now, and it's a setting in which younger scholars can place their published works. So this is very important. And we'll watch a piece of the renewal film, which is, again, our first entry into film projects to bring larger communities into consideration of these issues. Uh, some of the uh, activities that we continue to be involved in, uh, along with the Daedalus uh, publication some years ago, is to support this attention to climate change in various settings. And I just want to point out the indigenous environmental network. The attention of indigenous people to climate change is rather remarkable. The evidence and the statistical, the empirical evidence, which is being reported by indigenous uh, peoples and is being recorded by such a group as the Indigenous Environmental Network is, a, is substantial and, uh, as I want to indicate, very important. Uh, and on the ground group, Interfaith Power and Light is worth mentioning, uh, largely in the Christian, uh, Jewish, uh, Islamic communities in the U.S., but very focused on uh, church audits, on the whole idea of energy use by religious institutions. Another project that we began uh, quite early after the initial conferences on the religions was to raise the question of religion and animals. And this continues uh, this work at the Yale Center for Bioethics where we have our offices. So the uh, religion and animals group also at the American Academy of Religion where I just came from and also Neil was there. We uh, had a chance to chat a bit. Uh, that the professional organization of all religious teachers in the United States and Canada has significant groups on animals and also religion and ecology. I mentioned the uh, animal issue because the, many of you might know the Earth Mass at St. John the Divine held every October at the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi where they open the main doors. I think you should be aware it's only when the bishop comes and knocks on the door that they open the main doors at St. John the Divine. But at the Earth Mass, they open them for the animals. And they bring these animals right down the front, uh, the aisle, the central aisle. And people bring their dogs and cats. You can see in the background, it's remarkable to sit in the pews with parakeets, chickens, dogs, and whatnot. And not, uh, the place doesn't go into absolute mayhem. You know, it's a very interesting kind of moment. The music is especially remarkable. Paul Winter, who many of you might know, has done the music for probably, uh, it's, it's 15 years old now, the Earth Mass of Change on the Dawn. Uh, religion and water is where I'm heading to close up. Are we still okay? Yeah. Good. Um, the uh, religion, science, and environment symposium is where I'll go with the slide in just a moment. The Friends of the Earth uh, is a project which was uh, nurtured also uh, here at Yale at the World Fellows Center, and some uh, students, graduate students at Yale, are working on this project to bring the Abrahamic face together on a project to clean and refurbish the Jordan River. Many of the same issues with the Yamuna, so I'll save them for just a moment. But I did want to give some attention to the ecumenical patriarch. He has held eight conferences focused on water, beginning with the Aegean in 1995 and through the Mississippi River. Next year will be Lake Victoria in, in Africa. His, um, his intention is uh, to focus on environmental issues. So he gathers together on a, a single boat over 200 uh, politicians, scientists, academics, journalists, people who are focused on environmental activities. And rather than sailing to the significant tourist spots, 
he goes to these troubled environmental spots and the news articles that are generated out of that by the New York Times, uh, Manchester Guardian, there's significant uh, news attention uh, to these environmental spots, many of which are, are easily passed over by the press. So the patriarch is one of these uh, religious leaders who has uh, major thinkers like a metropolitan, John Zizoulas, uh, who's helping him think through a lot of these issues in terms of his own theological tradition. And uh, Bartholomew, this uh, ecumenical patriarch, has labeled uh, uh, industrial pollution as a sin. So he's uh, someone who's tried to find language to talk about these issues rather than simply abstract uh, orthodox statements. He's put himself in some uh, jeopardy within his own tradition. For example, on the Amazon, he allowed indigenous leaders, after he had apologized to them on behalf of Western civilization and what it had imposed on indigenous people, and a personal apology from his standpoint, he allowed indigenous leaders to bless him, and together they blessed the Amazon River. You can imagine what a leader like this would pay in his own tradition in terms of uh, collegial support for allowing other religious leaders to bless him. So he's a remarkable uh, um, uh, ecumenical and interreligious dialogue oriented person. Uh, the one case study, just a, a few close minutes on, this is coming up in January. And as I mentioned, Mary Evelyn is uh, helping to, um, in Delhi now, helping to get some of our logistics clarified. Uh, we're bringing together uh, a Yale Terry, huh? so Terry University in Delhi. But what's interesting here is the uh, joining of this uh, discussion on the Yamuna River by religious leaders from the Vrindavan area led by the uh, Radharaman Temple. Huh? So religious leaders from Vrindavan, leaders of significant pilgrimage sites. This is the setting. Uh, for a Vaishnava theology, namely where uh, Krishna consciousness uh, emerged uh, in India over the centuries. And uh, I, I mean by that the uh, uh, ancient tradition of, of Krishna awareness uh, mentioned in the, uh, in the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita and in later texts. So these religious leaders will come to Terry University on January 3rd and 4th and we'll, we, we will have a dialogue on the condition of the Yamuna River. The Vrindavan temples are all located on the Yamuna River. The Yamuna River is a goddess. Huh? So this is an effort to really uh, pay attention to what has happened to this river and the paradox of religious attitudes towards this river. So the Yamuna, as you can see in turquoise here, parallels the Ganga or Ganges River, the, these two major sacred rivers in northern India. And the Yamuna, when it comes out of the glacier uh, Yam at Yamanotri and uh, develops into a magnificent river in its especially first 100 miles, it's about a 900 mile long river before it joins the Ganges. It is actually larger than the Ganges when it joins it at Allahabad. Uh, but the looks uh, are subject to an incredible assault uh, about 100 miles from Delhi. This, literal, this uh, river is literally broken in half. It, and it's the two halves are channeled into two canals, which are uh, directed towards irrigation of the green revolution crops in the Doab, the region between the Yamuna and the Gan Ganges River. So this is an incredible fertile agricultural region, which is now water dependent. And the Yamuna is used totally to irrigate uh, those crops. What returns to the Yamada then is laced with um, agricultural runoff, pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers. Then that water is then dammed at uh, the entrance to Delhi, and that becomes Delhi drinking water. And the Yamana is uh, largely dry through Delhi, except for industrial waste and human waste. So there is flowage through Delhi, but it is eutrophic. Huh? And so beyond uh, Delhi, the Yamuna is largely uh, eutrophic. It will not support uh, overt life. There is aquatic life, uh, and that's uh, a miracle in itself. 
that there is still some life in the uh, Yamuna beyond Delhi. Uh, but this uh, raises then uh, one of the paradoxes, and I'm moving to a, a close, namely um, the issue of purity and pollution. That the Yamuna is, the, as pictured on the bottom here, is one of the beloved of Krishna. Like the gopi maidens, the herder of the, uh, the cattle, who are uh, from low caste, so the social justice issue is also very interesting uh, in the Vaishnava theological tradition. Uh, by, uh, what I mean by that, it's not simply a Brahmanical uh, focused religion where uh, this tradition and the person of Krishna himself, he becomes blue by absorbing the toxic poisons that had been put in the Yamuna River. So you can see the retrieval characteristic of old ideas in this tradition about toxins or poisons in the river. Uh, Krishna uh, is in relationship to the gopi maidens and to the river in an ecstatic relation of love. It's a tradition of, it's a bhakti tradition, it's a tradition of deep devotion. So we have, of course, this incredible paradox again where uh, even religious activity is undertaken which uh, seemingly wantonly throws um, garbage uh, from the ceremonials themselves into the Yamuna River. And the Yamuna here is a deeply polluted river. So the conference is an effort to call this paradox into question. How could a deified reality become so terribly defiled? Huh? The overarching agenda then in this religion and ecology project is to activate within the religious traditions in all of their difference. Now, so this is not simply a monological position, but rather extreme diversity in the traditions of, with regard to reverence and respect then for biodiversity and a sense of restraint, which Neil also mentioned, the ascetic impulses within these religious traditions now being seen in a broader range on the question, the uh, social justice question of distribution of environmental technology and aid uh, to assist uh, other peoples and countries to address their environmental issues as an act of responsibility more than in simply an anthropocentric setting but in an anthropocosmic understanding that we recognize ourselves as part of this reality that we live among and that this reality also shares with us this larger story of the emergence. We share with all of reality this sense of uh, uh, living uh, on a planet which is itself alive. And uh, how to understand the restoration project is obviously uh, one of the most challenging issues because it immediately begs Restore to what? And so that's a question I think that we all uh, ask ourselves. What is it that uh, we suddenly recognize it's gone? And uh, having recognized it's gone, we realize that in some linguistic traditions, gone is a temporal verbal. Gone is something which people understand as coming towards them. And gone is something which people realize they're entering into. And gone is something which people see happening. And having happened, they realize it's gone. We don't have that kind of language reflection in English so much, but I think we're capable of it. And restoration, I think, activates this kind of thinking. What is it that we restore to? Is it something past? Is it something present? Or is it something to which... Uh, we want uh, life uh, and ourselves to head towards. I hope. Thank you.